G'day guys, I am Cuffy and today I'm going to be building a chest of drawers, a full dovetailed construction, dovetailed carcass, dovetailed drawers, dovetails all over the place. Now this ends up being a fairly wide surface so the panels for the sides and the top end up a lot wider than my thickness are. So I'm using biscuits to join these two sort of wide panels together to create one wider panel because those biscuits will make sure that joint is dead flush at the end. It's really important because otherwise I have to mess around with hand planes to flatten out a, a wonky donkey panel but this is straight off the glue up. I've, I've done a little bit of sand in there to remove some excess glue but I haven't actually thicknessed or planed that surface at this point in time and it's dead flat so I really like it. I've got the two sides on my bench there and this is just the top that I'm cutting to length and about a metre long. The overall unit is a metre wide, about 820 millimetres high and about 500 millimetres deep. Just got to mark out some dovetails, a 1 to 8 ratio on this one. Give myself a square line to follow the saw with and then I can use my saw which is actually a cross cut saw. It's took, it took some work getting through this material. It's a relatively deep cut and relatively wide as well and with that cross cut saw it took a lot of effort to get through so that's why I've sped it all, all the way up. Now a lot of people like to use a coping saw to remove the waste here and then they chisel down onto the line. Personally I think it's six to one half a dozen to the other it, it, it takes about the same time either way so I just chisel out halfway down on one side and then I'll flip the entire thing over and pop out those dovetail pin waste pieces I guess you'd call them it's just the waste and out it pops took some doing but it got there now once again because these panels are relatively thick it casts quite a lot of shadow down into those sockets so it's really hard to see where my knife is so that's why I've got the torch over the top of it so I can see what I'm marking because it's really important to mark correctly here and the easiest way to get rid of that much waste. You could use a chisel to chop it out, but using the router like this, it just cleans it away very, very quickly and easily. And have a look at the bottom of that socket that I'm creating. It's dead flat, dead perfect, and I couldn't do that with a chisel if my life depended on it. So the router's the way to go. I really wish I did cut a little bit closer to the line with my router there. I could have, I've certainly got the skill to do it. I just, for some reason I was scared to do it this time, I don't know why, but next time I will definitely go a lot closer to those lines because this took quite a lot of time to clean up. It's very easy work, so long as I'm very accurate at the very top surface, because that's the finished surface that you can actually see, but underneath that top surface I can undercut those lines if I want to, and I certainly am and you'll never actually see it. It does weaken the joint a little bit, but the joint's not going to come apart. Like this is going to last a million years. The timber will rot out before these joints come apart. So I'm going to assume the top panel will fit into those sockets quite easily because I don't want to fit it. But these rails in the bottom of the panel, I can fit those because they're only small and it doesn't really matter if I break things, putting things in and out. Those ones are really loose though. So as you can see, I've gone and glued some veneer onto each of those sides of those tails there. And now, instead of being super loose, it doesn't even fit. This is on the underneath of the panel, the bottom of the panel, so it doesn't matter. Like, it looks terrible because that high contrast veneer that I've used there it looks absolutely awful but you'll never see it again and frankly I forget about it until I look at this video <laughs> and that's exactly where the bottom rails will connect to so I'm going to be having four drawers in this they're going to be graduated in height 140 millimeters high 150 160 and 170 so I need three horizontal draw divider rails and that's what those slots will be for. They will house the draw guides 
and then the rails that span from one side to the next will be housed in a sliding dovetail which is what that joint is right there. It's a very complicated set of parts right now. There's a lot of work in those two panels. So now with those sliding dovetails cut out I'm almost ready to assemble this carcass, the two bottom rails, the two sides and the top on top of it. But not yet, because what I need to do, if that's my side panel there, and they're my two bottom rails, these two bottom rails ideally should be a solid bottom. It shouldn't actually be rails like this. I've done it like this because all of this gap here, it saves a lot of weight, and I need to lift this up upstairs into my house later on. So the lighter it is, it's easier to lift. So I've done it this way. But what that means is it leaves a gap here. So when a drawer comes through here, it's gonna come through here and then fall down, right? That's no good. So I've machined up a stick and that will have to sit inside there. Somewhat, I have to cut it to length, obviously. And then the two sides will be able to slide over that, and get to the back rail. To join this into the two rails, this is the front here. I need to put a mortise into the back of that front rail and a tenon on the end of this here, and that will slip into there, and I'll glue that. But this side panel, that's going to expand and contract this way. So I can't do the same thing to the back because that, that width there will now be locked, it won't expand and contract with this. So what I need to do, this one's gonna be mortise and tenon in there, that's gonna be glued in there, that's gonna be a nice tight solid joint. This is also gonna be mortise and tenon, However, say for example that length there was 230 millimeters. From the shoulder of this tenon to the shoulder of that tenon, I will make that 225 millimeters, so five millimeters shorter, which leaves a little bit of a gap there. And then I won't glue this tenon in there, it'll just sit in there loosely. So that if this panel was to contract, it's gonna bring this back rail in with it taking up that five millimeter gap that I've got, or it might actually grow and become a little bit more, and so that five millimeter gap becomes six or seven millimeters. So the glue up on this carcass, although there's a lot of parts, it's actually relatively straightforward. I can glue in these two bottom rails plus the two draw guides on the bottom there at once, and then I can just walk away and let that glue dry. Then I can come back and put the top panel in there, and then walk away and let that dry. And I still have to get all of these other draw, horizontal draw rails in there as well. I don't need to put them in there now because they slide in through the front or through the back. I don't need to have any clearance from any other panels that may or may not get into the way because nothing will get in the way. So that's what's so good about these traditional methods using the dovetails that I've got on the bottom, the dovetails that I've got on the top, and the sliding dovetails that I've got on the horizontal draw rails. It just allows for a really, really stress-free, easy glue up. What also helps this joint to go together quite nicely is if you could chamfer the, what is it, like the leading edge of these dovetail tails. It just allows it to slide into the dovetail sockets quite nicely, quite easily, because you've got, I don't know, like a ramped surface going into a, a cave. It, um, it just makes it easier. So it's well worth you doing. And since I'm literally just waiting for the bottom panel to dry, I've got plenty of time to do this, right?
It's a little bit unfortunate that it cracked right at that front corner, but it is what it is. You take the good with the bad, a little bit of putty, a little bit of stain, a little bit of finish, and I can't see it in the finished piece, so it's all good. Sometimes you just have to say, enough clamps is exactly enough. That'll do it. So there's a few gaps here and there. Doesn't matter too much, a little bit of putty, a little bit of stain, nothing to worry about. She'll be good as gold, she's all good. This is something I wish I had done before I glued this up. I knew that I was forgetting something before I glued it up and what it was is I wanted to create a rebate or a rabbit into the back of the carcass to allow for the back panel to sit into. I can just apply the back panel to the back of those rails and sides and top if I wanted to, but it doesn't really look nice in the finished piece. I prefer to recess it into the surface as best I can, but because I've got all those uh, sliding dovetail sockets there, the bearing on my router would have fallen into it, so I had to use the fence for half of it and then the bearing for the rest of it. It was a bit of a pain in the butt. And I also want to go out of my way to make this back panel the exact size because it'll be the back panel that holds this carcass square because I'm telling you right now when I've glued it up I haven't really squared it up but this back panel will pull everything square just beautifully so if I do a good job of cutting the back panel square I put it into the socket it will fit perfectly and square everything up exactly right that's what that big clamp is doing because you can see I had to pull that carcass into square just to kind of force this back panel in It just needed some gentle persuasion. <laughs> 977. I'll just check the one below it, make sure they're all nice and consistent. 977. And 977. So close, half a millimetre. So then I need to know how deep those dovetails are from that shoulder inside there to the base of that. Now I want to be pretty accurate here but after extensive measuring I found that it's 11.65 and some of them are 11.8, some of them are 11.7. So I'm just going to aim for about 11.7 and whatever doesn't fill all the way I'll use putty to fill the rest. God gave us two hands each, they each operate independently of each other. The left hand is holding the timber up against the fence and my right hand is actually giving me my forward momentum. Neither of them are doing both. So we want those shoulders there to sit hard up inside this housing joint and then we want the dovetail to seat all the way to the back and we want it to be snug as a bug in a rug. And that's actually pretty neat and tidy. I think this dovetail needs to become just a little bit lot longer, so I need to raise the height of the bit just a little bit so that that shoulder moves backwards just that little bit. And I also need to move the fence back a little, um, no I need to bring the fence forward so that it takes less material off so that this becomes just that little bit wider and therefore tighter inside that slot. Now I've moved it so, so little that I can't actually see that rise and fall. What I can do is when I'm turning the knob on my router underneath there, if it's if the knob was facing this way and I turned it there, like an, a sixteenth of a rotation for example, I know that I've raised it up just a little bit. Next I wanted to take less material off so I'm going to bring this fence forward just a little bit so it becomes a little bit fatter. The, the dovetail becomes fatter. <sighs> Super highly technical this stuff. Oh, first punch. So we'll just 
slip that into there, across to the other side, slip that in there. That sort of fits. Aha! So it fits. Now, this is where you need to know exactly what you're doing, and this is why these videos are so good. I could push that all the way in there, right? And as you can see, it's actually a relatively tight fit. But if I was to get a hammer and hammer that in, it would certainly go in there. But then I have to remove it later on. To I've got to put a, a mortise into the back of there. So when I remove it, because there's going to be so much pressure in here, but more importantly, on these fibers in here, as I pull that out, there'll be a 100% chance that I'll rip half of this timber out as I pull it out. So, I'm going to assume that I'm going to get all of these right. I'm going to do everything I need to do. And the only time I'm going to put them all the way in is the time when I've got glue on there. And when I put them in there, they ain't ever coming out again. So, ever so carefully, I've only got this in about a sixteenth of an inch, one and a half mil. I just want to get this out without chipping out any of that timber. And we'll assume everything's going to be A-OK -okay from this point forward. Right, so if you recall what I did on the bottom there, I've got a rail at the bottom, this rail comes through and then there's a rail at the back. That rail there is mortise and tenoned at the front and glued together so that that's nice and solid. And at the back there's a gap there so that when this side panel contracts, that gap closes up and when that side panel expands, gets wider, that gap at the back will get wider. The same thing has to happen with these rails. There's one at the front, there'll be one across the back and then there's going to be a rail across there. So I'll put a tenon on the front here, which that's, gets glued into the mortise at the back there. And there'll also be a tenon on the back of this one, which floats loosely without any glue in the back of the, of the mortise on the back rail there that runs across there. These mortises, they're not overly critical. They're simply to position the draw guide rails. So I can just actually use a slot cutter and cut right into the end of it. It does make a relatively weak joint, but it's not a very structural joint to begin with, so it doesn't matter that much at all. And the last thing I need to do before I can put all these parts into the carcass is this mortise, it's actually a bit of a slot. It's actually rounded because I used a slot cutter, so it's rounded, so I just need to square that off so that when this piece comes in here, it's got a hard wall and it can't move too far into the center of the carcass. It's actually just stays there. So then what we want, we want this back edge here to be in line with that dovetail. That'll be in line with the groove inside the carcass. And then that way when this goes in here, it can move across. And it gets a little bit further, but then it hits the wall of that mortise and it can't keep on going that way. That's what we want. So as I was saying earlier that this glue up for the entire carcass, it's very, very simple. It's very low stress. Each of these rails on the front, I can just pull each of those in one at a time. Like I can put this one in right now and then I can come back in six hours later and put the other two if I wanted to. And then once those have dried, I can flip that carcass over and then start applying the draw guides into the back of those front rails, which are glued in nice and tight. And then the rear rails, slip in through the rear dovetail sockets or the sliding dovetail sockets over the top of the mortise and tenons which don't get glued in so i can do it all very stress-free not a not a care in the world 
And I think at some point when I was gluing this thing up, somebody did knock on the front door while I was gluing it up, which is like the worst thing in the world as a general rule when you're gluing things up. But with this, I said, okay, no big deal. I'm, I'm in no stress. I'm only doing one or two pieces at a time. I finish off those two pieces and said, yeah, what do you want? And they wanted some rubbish. I don't know, some of your Bible or whatever it was. <laughs> I told them to get stuffed and come back in and continued on without any dramas whatsoever. Now that rear joint only gets glue into the dovetail socket. I don't want to glue that mortise and tenon. That's very, very important. If I glue that mortise and tenon, the side panels will crack. The reason why they crack is because the side panels will want to expand at some point and because I've locked in the width, it's gonna to want to make up that gap somehow and so it literally just creates a gap by cracking. And that's that. That's my rails. Drawer's gonna slide in here, in here, in here, in here. Beautiful. Put the back on there and then we can start making drawers. All right, so now I need to build four drawers, dovetailed drawers to fit into each of their respective openings. I personally find building drawers unbelievably boring. Frankly, if I could get an apprentice to build all of my drawers for me, I bloody well would. So I'm about to spend about 40 minutes of your time having you guys watch me build drawers. If you were to skip to the end of the video right now, it would not offend me one bit because this video is merely the product of my initial edit. It's a rough edit and I've simply put it onto my second channel because it's quick and easy and it costs me nothing to put this video up there. So for those that are actually interested in seeing what I'm doing, how I've done it and whether I did a good job, by all means stick around and watch. For those that don't really care about draw making, by all means skip ahead. It doesn't offend me one bit because I really enjoy making the carcass and I really, really hate making drawers. <laughs> so I've got my draw parts cut to the right length. They fit in between these, these points there, just, it's very tight. It's going to be shaved down later on. But now I need to get them to fit into the height. Now I've ripped it to be fairly close to the height, but I don't want this ripped edge to be the final surface. I actually want this to be a plain surface. So I've set up my bench with a little bit of a, bit of a shooting board set up so I can sit up against this edge here, up against that block there, and that's raised up off the surface to avoid that little bit of solid steel on the bottom of my hand plane. And I can put this down on that edge there, which keeps the plane nice and square to this edge here. I don't have to put it in my vise and balance square. So this just makes everything easy. And I can simply push through and shave it down as required so that ultimately these parts fit into their respective position nice and tight. Now, as you can see, on this board here, it actually does fit into this side ever so slightly. It's very, very tight, but it does fit. On this side, however, it's about one millimeter too high. So I need to shave quite a bit off this end here. I'll pick my grain direction. I'll be shaving that side there, so that's against the grain. That's with the grain. And I forgot which corner I was cutting. This corner. corner I'm doing. So because I need to shave a lot off this corner here and nothing over here, I don't want to start all the way back here and start shaving. I want to start over here and basically bring this edge down onto a taper.
right, so that fits super tight, which is what we want. That fits super tight. So I'm going to leave that one there. It doesn't actually go into the cavity, but I can physically see that it's so close that once I've got the drawer fully assembled, I can get my hand plan and shave this down so that it suits. So now I want to do this to the rest of these parts so that it all fits. So when I'm just building one set of drawers, I'll go to the trouble of sizing all of my pieces to the exact size and everything fits tight. Now I can't leave it like that in the finished piece because once these timbers expand, they will get stuck into those locations and I won't be able to get the drawers out. But what I can do is I can build the drawers to the exact height and once the drawer is fully assembled and the glue is dried, that's when I can shave down the side so it fits into the uh, opening and I also can shave down the top of the drawer so that there's enough room for the timbers to expand and contract inside those fixed openings because if I don't allow for the expansion, the drawers do get stuck in those openings and you won't be able to open it until the next summer. Perfecto. So when I'm making drawers, whether it be a dovetail drawer, a dowel drawer, or a pocket hole drawer if I ever make one, I like to put a small rebate or rabbit on the inside edge of the side panels. What it does, it just cleans up that joint just ever so slightly and it also allows me to sand or finish plane the inside face of that drawer without affecting the joinery at all. So I always do it. I don't have any examples of what it looks like without doing it. But if I ever do it the other way, I'll show you and you'll find that the other way generally looks like crap. This always looks very, very neat and tidy on the inside of the drawer when you put the rebate on there though. So then it is time to cut these dovetails. Now I've got a dovetailing jig here, it works pretty good. It puts my angle of the dovetail and also holds the saw nice and square and that's what we're trying to do. We want to keep the saw very square this way and then when we coming down on the angle, although it's on the angle, we want to cut a nice straight line from one point to the next. So you can use a jig, or you can do it by hand, whatever you prefer. By hand or by jig. Let's get money. Put on the wrong one. I think the jig is a little bit more consistent, but it's also a little bit slower because now I'm having to move it across each time. But it does work. Or I can simply get rid of the jig and do it by hand. And as you can see, by hand it's a lot quicker. But if you don't have the confidence, the jig helps a lot. One, two, three, four, five, yep, that's done. Now I can remove the waste between these pins, the ones on the top I can cut off with a saw. So being very careful to cut on my line exactly perfectly. That'll do it. I just have to square a line, so I'm just going to put my knife up against this rebate edge here. Puts it in position, square my line. Cut it with the saw.
overall it doesn't take that long. Pretty good. Once I'm happy with the location and get the handy dandy hold fast, might want that lock in under just a little bit. Put that there. Am I happy? Check, 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 check. I'm pretty happy. Another thing that that rebate that I put into the edge of the side panels is that it allows me to hook it onto the front or rear panel very, very definitely in the exact right position. So I can be very confident that I'm going to be marking this out in the correct position. So then we're going to cut this shape out of here using my knife lines and we're going to cut it that deep there. I have no idea what the measurement of that depth was, but when this drawer gets assembled and all glued up, the side panels, they're going to sit out proud of the front and back just that little bit. That's going to give me a little bit of meat to plane down so that I can gradually adjust the width of the drawer to fit into the drawer opening just perfectly. Because I don't want to have a situation where I've got a drawer that's already too narrow and still requires sanding or planing on the sides to smooth out the surfaces because then it becomes even more narrow and more wrong. So if it starts off way too big I can just shave it down gradually until it fits perfectly. So as I start to chisel the, what is it, the back wall of the dovetail socket on the front of the drawers, I end up with a very thin bit of material. It's only about three millimeters thick, so it's very easy to break off with a chisel. That's why I've got that backer block clamped to that drawer front right there. It just helps me not break things off. Now it is still very thin. I still can break it, but luckily I didn't this time, but I have done many times in the past. Well, 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 look at that, it's good enough. So with the half blind dovetails on the drawer fronts appropriately chiseled out, they're ready to go, I can move my attention to the through dovetails on the back of the drawers. I'd be curious as to what you guys think. What's easier, a through dovetail or a half blind dovetail? I'm strongly in the camp of a half blind dovetail is much easier to achieve a good looking joint because you've only got one surface that you can see in the finished piece but a through dovetail has two different surfaces that you can see in the finished piece so that's twice as much work that you have to look, um, be perfect, no gaps. Now because this is the back of a drawer it doesn't really matter if there is gaps and I can tell you right now I've got a lot of gaps in my through dovetails, it doesn't really bother me, back of the drawer it's it's deep in a deep dark cave you never ever see it again so I literally will never ever see it again and I've got to say using a scroll saw to remove the dovetail waste here a little bit excessive but it bloody well works I really like doing it this way because I really hate a coping saw I wish I had to film this in slow-mo because if you watch carefully as I'm entering that chisel into the timber you can see that the chisel is moving backwards towards the inside of the drawer it's actually pushing my cut line forwards a little bit 
which is, it creates all sorts of gaps in the finished piece. Part of the reason is because I'm using a chisel that's far too blunt and far too wide. If I was using a smaller chisel, it probably wouldn't do that. Or if I was using a sharper chisel, it probably wouldn't do that. But I was using neither, so I've got nothing but gaps. I've seen better but it's good enough so now that I've finished hacking away with my chisels creating the dovetail sockets and dovetail tails I can now put a small groove on the inside bottom edge of the front of the drawers and the two sides of the drawers and that will accept the drawer bottom it's just going to be a six millimeter plywood bottom and then the bottom edge of the back of the drawer gets ripped completely off to make way for the drawer bottom to be slid in from the back of the drawer. I want to get the groove a little bit wider than my 6mm, in this case it was 6.2. I probably should have gone for 6.5 because my plywood was not quite 6mm thick, it was a little bit more and it took quite the effort to get it in there. I'm not going to show that on video but you can trust me, it took ages. This is just the bottom of the drawer being ripped off at the exact same measurement as whatever the groove was. And then I'll show you just how perfect this works. Look at that, the groove is perfectly aligned with the bottom of my drawer back. Once again, it's another stress-free glue up. You've got four pieces, it all gets dovetailed together. It kind of holds itself together mostly. A couple of clamps, walk away, come back tomorrow. It's good as gold, mate, good as gold. So the dovetails on the drawer box are all good and well, but it doesn't really hold the drawer box square. But the bottom panel of the drawer will hold it square if you've sized it appropriately. A little bit similar to the way that the drawer back on the carcass holds the carcass square, the drawer bottom does the same thing. So it's really important to size it correctly. So if the gap between the two grooves on the two sides was, I don't know, 900 millimeters, cut your drawer bottom to be 900 millimeters or 899.8 millimeters or something like that so that the drawer box is held square and it can't become a rhombus I think it is so with the drawers all glued up and the bottoms applied I just want to put some wax on the inside of this carcass so that when I start fitting the drawers I'm not going to be tempted to remove too much material off the side of the drawers simply because I've got timber on timber rubbing and getting stuck on each other. A little bit of wax makes everything slide beautifully. So now with that carcass nicely waxed up at the back there, I need to make these drawer boxes fit inside that carcass. As we know, they're currently too big because we pushed these sides out just a little bit so I can plane them back so that they actually fit in. And where we're going to plane back to is the end of this front and the end of that back panel. That's basically going to be hopefully where we need to plane back to. It might be a little bit too big even at this point so we can still plane back more if we need to but that's where we're trying to get to. So what we can do, we can put it in our vise like this if we wanted to, if we were crazy. And basically I can grip it on that front there and then I can get my plane and plane across but I can guarantee that won't work very well because this is only thin material, it's about 10 millimeters thick and I can actually, I can see that that's flexing down just under the weight of my thumb. So if I put that under the weight of my hand plane, 
when it presses down, it's going to create a, a hollow, a concave, which will mean it sits on the plane here and here. But my blade is here. So it's actually not gonna cut on the middle here. I'll be able to go here and it'll miss, 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 miss and and hit there. So what we actually wanna do is something a little bit more specific to the job that we're doing. So I've got a couple of fairly thick but very flat boards here. They're actually cutting boards that were no good. So I didn't wanna sell these ones so I can use it here. And I can sit this over the top and that just sits on there like so, and that allows me to plane all the way across and give support under this very thin material with this timber here, so I can actually just plane it. I've made sure that the, the front towards the back, the grain direction runs that way, so that I can put my plane on the front and then push off at the back. And that might break out these backs, but that's a lot better than coming this way and breaking out the front. However, because this is a back, and I also need to do it anyway, I can put a little chamfer across the back. See, broke it all out, doesn't matter. And now those chamfers on those end grain pins shouldn't break out as much as what they would have. I've hit that one, I've hit that one. So I'm very close to this back edge, but this front edge is still a little bit high, so I'm just going to taper, taper off and lift up and lift up and lift up so I've hit here and the rest is very, very close. I've hit here, but not here, so I'm playing from here down. Very, very close. So I'm pretty close. I'll, I'll put this one down. I'll just get my smoothing plane out. And we'll just do some full, full length passes just to make sure there's no steps like this here. Ah. I tell you what, it's not bad, not bad at all, mad. So I've got the other three drawers fitting into their respective openings and they're fitting pretty nicely. However, they're very tight on the height of each of the drawers. Now I've done that quite deliberately because now I can shave off the top to allow for the timber movement over the specific season. So currently in Melbourne, I'm in summer and so everything's very dry in summer in Melbourne. So the timber is in a contracted state. As I move into winter in six months time, the humidity is going to rise and the timber is going to absorb that humidity and it's going to expand. So when I allow for expansion, I try to allow for 1%. 
So these drawers are roughly 150 millimeters high. If I allow for one and a half millimeters clearance above the drawer so that timber expands into that clearance space that I've allowed for it, the drawers shouldn't, shouldn't hopefully get stuck in the middle of winter. If they do get stuck, you just have to wait six months and you can open the drawer and then you can shave off a little bit more for the following year. But one and a half mil or 1% should be okay. If you're living in an area where winter freezes over and all of the humidity in the air freezes and becomes ice on the ground, your winter might actually be a lot drier than your summers. But here in Melbourne, it simply gets cold. It doesn't get ice cold though. And you can see here, I've made sure to plane away this top edge so that there's enough room so when this expands in winter, it's currently summer, so everything's very contracted, it's very dry. When it rehydrates through the humid winter, it's going to swell up and it'll take up that space. Hopefully it doesn't take up too much space because otherwise it gets stuck. So I actually had all sorts of crazy ideas as to what style the base of this chest of drawers was going to be, but given the fact that I've been working on this chest of drawers for the best part of three years now, believe it or not, I made four tapered little legs, and that's all I need to do. It looks pretty bloody good though. Very easy base though. <laughs> so this was my original idea to have these legs flush to this corner. I don't think it looks very good. But if I set them back in from the edge and the face, it creates that little bit of a shadow under there. It brings the carcass forward and makes the carcass more prominent. And I think that actually works. I like it. If you don't have an edge sander yet, you gotta get one. Better than sliced bread. And there's not many things better than sliced bread, but an edge sander is. One of the best ways to attach little tapered legs like this is with insert nuts or with screws or a lag bolt or something like that. But the problem is because it's just one fixing point they can rotate so you can see that I've routed out a little housing just to stop those square legs from rotating so they are always in the correct position. It's a little bit more work and you don't usually do it in industry but because you're only doing one piece for yourself you can do that little bit of extra work and it just works great. Good as gold. So with the construction complete, I now have to fix any problems that I've created during construction, such as the timber selection. We've got some gum pockets, gum veins, they need to be filled. Gum pockets and gum veins through the top. There's probably some gaps through those dovetails in the top. I've also got a little bit of damage here in this bottom corner, which I'm actually fortunate there that I can fix that. What I need to do is need to cut a nice clean straight line, glue a little bit of timber in there, and that timber would actually match these grain lines coming down on this angle here. So I got kind of lucky there. Unlucky that there's damage, but lucky that I can fix it. And then on the other side, I've got gum veins and whatnot. Pretty good. That looks to be wrong by exactly one saw curve width. 
it's almost as if somebody cut on the wrong side of the line. <laughs> Now I know the internet has an absolute wildest obsession with using epoxy to fill defects. This is automotive filler. You can colour it using brick oxides that dries within 20 minutes. You can sand it without gumming up your sandpaper. Use automotive filler. Don't use epoxy because epoxy is bloody expensive and it takes forever to dry. Not great, but good enough. This stuff is even better. This is just putty. It's a water-based putty. I don't know whether it's available all around the world, but it's very stinky, but it's cheap, and it accepts the stain. So if I put a black stain on this, all of that putty will turn black. If I put a red stain, it'll turn red. It, it works out pretty well, but it's not really only good for very small, minor defects, like little hairline cracks and that sort of stuff, or hairline cracks within your joinery, if you've ever got any of those. I get them sometimes, like this time. <laughs> and once again, even though the drawer fronts on these drawers are thicker than the drawer sides, they're still relatively thin at 19 millimeters thick. So when I put the hand plane on there, it will deflect and I won't be able to plane the surface properly. So that's why I've set up my bench to support the surface of that timber so I can plane relatively stress-free and easily and I get a pretty nice job of it. So the front of the carcass is nice and flat, the drawer fronts are smooth and flat. Took a step back. I hate it. I hate this so much. It's very, very flat. It's very, very featureless. It's very, very boring. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. So I'm going to push these drawer backs, or drawer fronts back just that little bit by about five millimeters. You see the difference that makes? It creates a little bit of feature at the front, it creates a little bit of depth, and it's now interesting to look at. Simple change, massive difference. Now for the fronts, the drawers are going to go into this socket and go a little bit further. So I need to cover some of this surface here, but I don't want to cover it all. So I just want to go in about three quarters of an inch, 19 mil, thereabouts. But because this is going to be for myself, I'm not going to bother about doing a neat job. I'm just going to get it in there and then good enough. If I was doing it for a client, I'd have all this masked out. So it's a nice, neat, straight line, but it's a hell of a lot of work and you don't really gain anything for it. So this is just a teak brown spirit stain. I use a roller to apply most of it. And if I need to cut in around the corners, I'll use a paintbrush or a, or a rag. And then shortly afterwards, I come back with a rag afterwards to wipe off any excess because you don't want to leave too much excess on the surface because it does become relatively blotchy. So you can see the side panels are very even, nice color. And yeah, it comes up nice. I, I really like it. I'm just putting a little bit of dye stain on my rag here just drag it across and I don't want to go down this inside face of the drawer but it doesn't really matter if I do because I'm pretty easy going and I'm the customer just 
wrap that top edge as much as I can. So on the draw, I'm going to start in the middle and pull it out to the edges if I can get there. And that gives me a fairly dry pad to do these ends, this top edge, this bottom edge, and this other end over here without squeezing too much oil everywhere. So I won't actually be finishing the inside of the drawers or the inside of the carcass with anything except a little bit of wax on the drawer sides. But as far as inside the drawers or the inside of the carcass, that remains completely unfinished because you don't really need to finish it. I know a lot of people say, oh, whatever you do to the outside, you have to finish with the same on the inside. Otherwise, you're going to get differential timber movement, blah, 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 blah. But the key point there is blah, 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 blah. It just doesn't matter. Just finish the outside and that's good enough. Beautiful. The wax on the drawer sides will allow the drawers to slide in there very, very cleanly, very, very easily. Some might say better than the brand new modern metal slides, but I don't think anybody would believe me if I said that. Piece of piece. And now we give it a test fit. How does it look? So what I'm looking for here is I want those draw faces to be, to appear like they're in a straight line. I don't want one to be, let's see if I can do this. I can clearly see that that bottom one is too far forward. So I want it to look pretty nice and pretty, pretty straight, pretty even. And it looks, Pretty good. So I'm going to have two handles on each of those drawers. I've located each of those handles to be in the middle of the two outer thirds of the width of the drawer. Understand? That's how I do it. It might not be correct, it might not be the traditional way, I don't really know, I don't really care. I've just put it in the center of the two outer thirds. So one sixth in from the edge. thank you very much for watching remember to hit that thumbs up hit that subscribe button and I will see you in the next one catch us later